YouTube. How is everybody today? Long time no see. I decided that I was coming back to you. So here I am. It's Detroit Alley Cat. Thank you so much for joining me for True Crime Tuesday. Always makes it on Wednesday because I'm always so crazy busy. I kind of took like a little vacation last week. I had like a surgery. I had my birthday, and then I adopted a puppy. So I have two puppies now. I'm not going to bring the puppy on the channel on the, at the moment because life is crazy with two puppies, and I'm lucky that I'm sitting here right now with you. So let's talk about this case. I had all these different cases that I was going to do, and... I just couldn't because this one case, like, I was really going, like, deep on it. I was researching it. I was looking at it. And I didn't even think that I was going to do this case. I just thought that there was something about it that really interested me. And I want to talk about it a little bit before we jump into it because it's important that you understand some things. So we are going to talk about the Diane Schuler case and the Diane Schuler case is a case that happened in 2009 and it like it got national attention national attention not just like a little headline here and there but it, it was a very big case for so many reasons so on that note i have looked at all of like the research the data i looked at other other people's youtubes and i'm gonna be honest with you i i don't want to like give you every nook and cranny because the family of diane schuler has decided to try to clear her name and because of that there are so many weird corners and nooks and crannies to this. I just want to go over the main facts, which by the way, are going to be somewhat of speculation. And I will tell you about why, because I mean, I'll tell you about why right now. There is no way we can, t we can decide what really happened in this case, because the only person that knows what happened in this case is Diane Schuler. But I can speculate and I can give you some of the facts that I believe are extremely relevant to it and we can go through it. So on that note, let's get spooky. So let's talk about Diane Schuler. Diane Schuler was a, a very strong woman. She was in her 30s. She lived with her husband and her two children. She was a the breadwinner of her family. She was known for being very organized. She was like the outgoing person. She she had a lot of really beautiful qualities about her and her family described her as the rock. And what happened in 2009 became one of the biggest mysteries in New York because it just, Diane Schuler did not fit what happened. And it's just, it's still a mystery to this day. So let's talk about it. It's known as the 2009 Tectonis State Parkway crash. It occurred at 1.30 p.m. on Sunday July 26, 2009. I I hope I, I always do this. I'm like, I hope I say this right. But I mean, this one is, I, I think I'm saying it right, but I might say it wrong. Ever since Pike Town or Pick Town, I've been a little bit nervous. So Taconic, it looks like it should be Tetonic, but I think it's Taconic State Parkway is located near the village of Briarcliff, New York. And it's a really beautiful scenic area. Diane took her kids and her three nieces and her husband and their family dog on a camping trip that weekend. And that's where they were coming from. What happened was Diane was in a minivan and she ended up driving head on the wrong way on a highway and she collided with a SUV and she ended up killing eight people. 
she went 1.7 miles on a highway in the wrong direction. And many witnesses said, like, when they spotted Diane driving, that she looked really confident. She didn't really, like, swerve. She didn't look like she was scared. She looked like she thought everybody else was in the wrong. The crash was the worst fatal motor accident to occur in Westchester County since July 26, 1934. Which is kind of crazy because I decided that I wanted to see, I wanted to find out about this bus accident in 1934. And I had to like read old, old newspaper articles about it. And there are like three different like amounts of people, fatalities that happened in this crash. One of the articles said 15, one article said 19. And one article said 20. And what's really interesting about this crash is it was a baseball, like, they were a baseball group and they were going, I'm sure it's not called a baseball group, but I'm calling it a baseball group, okay? It was a baseball group and they were going to go to Sing Sing Prison to play the prisoner's team. And on the way there, they got into an accident because of the faulty brake system. I guess like 40 people were injured. It was a really interesting sidebar to this whole case. And the only reason I bring it up is because it's very rare that a county will have a, a mass crash fatalities like this. And in this area, which is a rural area of New York... There are two of them. Two of them. And I just, I, I mean, I do paranormal stuff, so I just think that's something that we should mention just because it's interesting, you know? Some of you guys will be like, wow, that's really weird. Some of you will be like, Detroit Alley Cat, that has absolutely nothing to do with that case. But I think it kind of does, considering it's the same highway and the fact that that was like a huge fatality automobile accident. I just think it's a weird coincidence. The reason for the controversy was because there's a bunch of reasons, actually. Her husband, Dan Daniel Schooner, the husband of Diane Schooner, she he says that he does not believe what the coroner stated and autopsy results and all that stuff was correct. And the reason that he's saying that is because when they did the toxicology for Diane Schooner, uh, she actually was heavily intoxicated at that time, and she also had a very high amount of THC in her system. Now, her husband has said that she never drank, and then he recanted it and said that she did drink at the campground, but not the night before. She had one drink a month. He, she, he never, she never had marijuana, but then she did have marijuana because she had insomnia. So it's very sketchy. And the thing is, is that I really think he's trying to like compensate for the fact that his wife like got into this car crash and killed eight people including herself. So she killed seven, but she killed eight if you want to include her. Uh, the other thing is, is that the husband ended up doing a movie with HBO, which is a very, very interesting movie, and it has a lot of information about this case that I think you would find really relevant. And they have footage of this case. Uh, it's called Something's Wrong with Aunt Diane. And it's basically like a take on the phone call that Emma Hance, one of Diane Schuler's nieces who went camping with them, she ended up calling her father before the accident and she said that something was wrong with Aunt Diane and they made a whole movie about it. So when they made this a movie, when they made this a movie, Daniel Schooner signed a contract with HBO and he made a hundred thousand dollars. So there is a lot of controversy about that because Diane Schooner is implicated in being the one responsible for these seven plus her deaths. And the fact that he profited off of this is pretty bad. He says it's to basically clear 
her name. And he also says that the money that he made from the HBO movie is going to go to his son, the lone survivor of the accident. But it's a really good movie. There was something else that was very controversial about this accident. Um, the thing that was most devastating to the family, I would have to say, for families that were involved was there was a bottle of absolute vodka that was in the minivan that Diane Schuler was driving. And when she got into the accident, the bottle of vodka came out and it was like broken up. But you could tell she had a bottle of absolute vodka in the front seat inside the minivan. And a lot of people thought that meant that she was a drunk. So let's talk about the toxicology a little bit. So what happened is after the accident occurred, Daniel Schuler, Diane's husband, and his sister-in-law, one of his brother's wives, her name was Jay, they hired a investigator named Tom Ruskin. And, and actually what's interesting is there's a lot of controversy about Tom Ruskin too. Because Tom Ruskin was a very charismatic character, and he went on a lot of interviews, and he basically, like, he, like, stood up for the family. And he was like, I don't, he's like, something happened. I don't know. You just have to watch his interviews. Basically saying that he didn't believe that the entire truth about what happened to Diane Schuler was out there because nobody had ever seen her drunk and he was a narcotics police officer prior to becoming an investigator and never in his 30 years of serving has he ever seen a drug test that could monitor the amount of THC in the body which was kind of like a big thing because when they did the toxicology report they said that Diane Schuler had a very large amount of THC in the body and it basically showed that she could have smoked marijuana 15 minutes to an hour prior to the accident. And so if you are not familiar with THC, THC is the drug that is in marijuana that gives you euphoria. I don't feel euphoria off of it, but um, some people do. They, they feel like pain relief. You just... Tom Ruskin, he, like, went on this tirade about this drug thing where the THC couldn't be measured, but what I really found interesting about that, and now I'm going to give you a little information about me, is I used to work, I was in the Army, and when I was in the Army, I used to work for JAG as a paralegal, and one of the things that was part of my job was to make sure that soldiers that had not followed the correct rules that the military army had had, they would be chaptered out or exited from the army. And I quite often had to chapter out soldiers because they had smoked marijuana, which is at the time was illegal to smoke and the army job or the military definitely did not want you smoking marijuana while you're getting deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq. And when I would do this paperwork, I recall seeing plainly right there in front of my eyes an amount of THC. I really recall seeing there was like a amount. It didn't matter what the amount was. If you had THC in your system when you were in the military, if it was in your system, you were going to get taken out of the military. But they had these amounts. Like it could show you if it was a high amount of THC or a low amount of THC. And typically what would happen is like we would get a, like a four-day weekend. And like right when you would get back from the four-day weekend, you would have to like they would make everyone do a drug test. And that's when people would test positive for THC, cannabinoid, stuff like that. And most of the time, the THC content wasn't very high because what the, the soldiers would do is they would smoke the pot during the weekend and then they wait until like they got back on Tuesday. They try to drink a lot of water. There's different kinds of drinks you can drink that would make the THC not show up. But it would be in there. And 
I just, I'm just telling you this because this Tom Ruskin who worked for narcotics for 30 years is saying that he doesn't know of any test that you can test for that will show you the amount of THC in someone's body, which, you know what, if you get pulled over, no. There, the cop cannot, like, put something in your mouth and say, blow, and it'll show you the amount of THC. However, if you get into an automobile accident, which, by the way, the newest, biggest driving while intoxicated is on marijuana, and they are, it's getting pulled over more than people who drink, and I just got that information from a bunch of crime statistics, they can test for THC. Uh, they can do a blood test, they can do a urine test, they can do a hair test. When they do an autopsy, they run a toxicology report. So, I don't know why he said that. It's just kind of weird. I guess maybe because he thought, like, if he was going to do a narcotics bus, they couldn't, like, test you on the spot. But they most definitely can test you for THC and find out what level of amount is in your body. And Diane Schuler's amount was very, very high. And the thing is, is that Diane Schuler's husband, Daniel, he would say stuff like, uh, she never smoked marijuana. And then he would be interviewed on a different interview and he'd be like, well, she had insomnia and she, she did smoke it. The thing is, is that he was always caught and implicated in changing these stories. And the thing is, is that like, if you do that, even if you're trying to protect somebody you love, you can no longer be credible. Nothing you say can be credible. So from the public's point of view and the family's point of views that was involved in this fatal car crash, nothing Daniel Schuler said was credible. Even though he didn't do any, he really, well, we don't know if he did anything wrong. He was trying to honor his wife's name. And there's so many reasons he could have done that, but no one could listen to him because he never kept his story straight. And the thing is, is that something I have learned from being around investigators, law enforcement, is the truth always stays constant. You do not have to make up a story and remember it if it's the truth. It won't change if it's the truth because it is the truth. And it will stay the same no matter what. Now, if you're ever in an, if you've ever been arrested or you're being interrogated by a police officer, be careful because they will lie to you to get you to say anything. So sometimes they can be kind of tricky and you can say things. And there are cases where people have admitted to crimes they haven't done. But I don't really feel like this is a case with Daniel Schuler because he didn't really, he wasn't implicated in doing anything wrong. There were people that talked about it that said like, well, he must have been doing something to her if she did this. Or why is he lying like this? Why is he trying to cover it up? I just think that he's trying to like, I think he's trying to like do the woman he loved right. And as much as that makes a lot of people angry because Diane Schuler killed people. It's just what's happening. Or at least I'm speculating. So moving on. So Tom Ruskin, he was the investigator, like I said, and he went on about all these different toxicology things. And then after a certain amount of time, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Tom Ruskin actually ended up ghosting the family. He stopped picking up the family's phone calls. And if you watch the documentary, the family is constantly like, well, the DNA and the toxicology needs to be tested again. And the thing is, is that's why they hire Tom Ruskin to test the DNA and to test the toxicology again. And they said that they kept trying to call Tom Ruskin and get the information, but he would never give it to them. Now, here's the part that wasn't like really... It's in the documentary, but it kind of just, like, creeps up. Tom Ruskin, so this is, we, we have to, we have to believe what Tom Ruskin says, but even Daniel Schuler's sister-in-law was on the phone with Tom Ruskin and admits that this is the truth. 
Tom Roskin calls back the sister-in-law, her name is Jay, and tells her, like, hey, I was trying to call you guys back at this date. Why didn't you pick up the phone? And she basically says, well, because they told me not to because they didn't want me to get involved and I didn't know what to say. And he said, well, I was trying to call you back with the toxicology report and the DNA. And he said, well, I'm just going to tell you this. And I really believe he said this because HBO was doing the documentary and obviously recording his voice. He says, the toxicology report that we had ran again and the DNA, which they got another DNA test because they wanted to prove that the DNA that they had was not Diane Schuler's, proving her innocence. But what happened was Tom Ruskin said the DNA and the toxicology proved exactly what the first time they ran it happened, that she was intoxicated with both marijuana and alcohol. All right, let's talk about the timeline of events because this will help you understand more of what happened. And I've seen a lot of YouTubes where they just kind of deep dive into like all the different parts of the case, but they don't really tell you exactly what happened. So I'm going to tell you each and every part because that way you won't be so confused. Um, this isn't like the most confusing case. It's just one of them cases where so many conspiracies can be made about it. So they, let's start it with the timeline. Diane Schuler and Daniel Schuler went on a camping trip with their two children, two-year-old and a five-year-old, and they brought with them their three nieces, Diane Schuler's brother's children. And they went camping all weekend, and on Sunday, they decided to pack it up. According to Daniel Schuler, they woke up, they made breakfast, they had coffee, and they packed it up. The owner of the camping ground said that they saw Daniel Schuler and his pickup truck, and Diane was in a red Windstar 2004, which is weird because I used to own a 2004 Windstar. It was not a good vehicle, but the the, the thing that's a very interesting fact about that is that Windstar was actually borrowed from Diane Schuler's brother. So Diane Schuler's brother is the father of the three girls that went camping with them. So the girls were in their minivan and Diane Schuler was driving it. So the girls were in fr the Diane Schuler and the children were in front of Daniel. He was in the pickup truck. And he had the family dog with him. At 9.30, Sunday, July 26, 2009, 36-year-old Diane Schuler left Hunter Lake Campground. And she was, the Hunter Lake Campground is in Parksville, New York. She was in a 2000, it was actually a 2003 Windstar. I said a 2004, but we're just cutting hairs at that point. The husband left the campground and arrived straight home. Diane Schuler decided that she was going to go ahead and go to McDonald's first. And she got the kids some breakfast and they played in the playground for a little bit. The owner of the campground told Diane Schuler to drive home safe. She said, I will. And this is kind of like speculation because we, we can't, we can't tell what an alcoholic would be like, or somebody who is drunk, because there's so many factors that go into it, and we'll get into that in a minute, but the owner of the campground said when she talked to her, Diane did not appear to be drunk. After she went to McDonald's, she then pulled over and went to a Sunco. There is some video footage of Diane Schuler going into the Sunco, looking around, and walking right back out. The attendant that worked at Sunco had been questioned by Tom Ruskin, the Daniel Schuler and Daniel Schuler's sister-in-law, Jay. And they said that the attendant said that Diane walked in and asked for pain medication. Now, we can't verify if this is true or not because, like I said, we can't we can't say that anything that Daniel Schuler says is credible because he, because he was caught changing his story. His sister-in-law, uh, we just don't know if what she says is credible. And Tom Ruskin, 
you definitely you, you he's hired by the family. So whatever he says, I I speculate that it's going to be swayed by his client who had to pay them like t- him 20 or 30,000 dollars to investigate this. So after the, she went to the gas station, Schuler left the gas station at 11 a.m. She traveled along Route 17. She entered Romapo Slotsburg. She cro- then crossed the Tampan Z Bridge. Witnesses that watched her make this uh, witnesses that watched her make this trip said that she was tailgating. She was driving aggressively. She was honking, and at various spots, I believe three, she pulled over, and witnesses spied her on her knees, making motions like she was vomiting. At 11.37, she called her brother, Warren, and she told him that they were being delayed by traffic. Warren said that she sounded perfectly fine. It seemed okay. At 11.45, she pulled over, and this is when one of the eyewitnesses said that they saw her vomiting. At 1 p.m., Diane Schuler's niece called Hans. That was her father, and she told her father that Aunt Diane had problems seeing. She actually said something is wrong with Aunt Diane, which is where the documentary came from. I think I said that, and she... Well, seemed a little scared when she was talking to her father. Her father asked to speak to Diane, which is her brother, and Diane starts talking to her brother, and her brother says, you know what? You need to get off the road. Diane says that she's having problems seeing, that she feels really weird. He says, you need to get off the road. I'll come get you. Something of that effect, but she obviously did not listen to that, and what's really sad is that the Han- the Hans parents of the three children, which were Diane Schuler's nieces, could hear their children crying. They seemed scared. They were talking really loud. And when Diane Schuler was questioned about this, Diane Schuler just said they're playing. And she said that she was slur- they said that she was slurring. She didn't sound herself. She sounded really disoriented. This really concerned the girl's parents, obviously, for many reasons. Something else is one of the stops that people say she stopped at and looked like she was vomiting at, she ended up leaving her cell phone there. And the reason we know this is because somebody at this stop ended up finding the phone and turning it in, and it was identified as Diane Schuler's phone. At 1.33, two drivers called and noticed a van driving the wrong way. It was noted that the van was going 75 to 85 miles an hour on the wrong way. I think it passed like three different vehicles. These people were interviewed on the documentary and they said that they were terrified because it was like a split second. Diane Schuler passed them up. They moved out of the way. They noted that Diane Schuler was not making any move to move out of the way. She seemed very like determined in going forward. While she was driving like this, she went 1.7 miles. She hit a trailblazer SUV. Inside of this trailblazer SUV was 81-year-old Michael Bastardi. 49-year-old son Guy, 71-year-old friend of the Bastardis, Don Longo, and I believe one of their vehicle actually hit another vehicle, and thankfully those people in that vehicle ended up surviving, but those three gentlemen that I just mentioned, all three of them died, and it was a very gruesome scene when Diane ended up Getting into the accident, her car, her minivan, it engulfed in flames. Uh, Two of the nieces died. Her daughter died and she died. Her son and one of the nieces were rushed to the hospital. The son survived. The last remaining niece ended up dying that day. And the rest I kind of went over with you. Her BAC was 0.19%. Uh, The legal limit in New York is 0.08%. They said that that was approximately 10 drinks. And what was kind of 
terrifying is that there was more alcohol inside of her stomach contents, and they said that that was closer to 0.25%, which is very, very high. And this is basically where we're getting into alcoholic alcohol poisoning. People pass out. People can die. The THC was supposed to be really high, like I said. Daniel Schuler. When all of this happened, as hard as this was for him after the funeral for the family, he basically went in front of the news and said that he believed his wife was not drunk. There had to be another reason why there was an alcohol content inside of her and that he believed that she had an abscess with her tooth and that that she could have had a stroke because of that, or she was having migraines. There were so many bizarre stories that he came out with. And, and while it is true that you can have an abscess with your tooth, the likelihood of her having a stroke and dying, and that being the cause of why there is alcohol in her system and THC in her system, there's just no reason for the alcohol to be in her system or the THC, even if she had a stroke. And before I go into some of my speculation, I do want to talk about Jackie Hance and Warren Hance. These are the mother and the father of the three girls. It was so horrific for them to hear their daughters before they died. I can't even imagine what they went through. Warren Hance's sister was Diane Schuler, and she was the cause of his three daughters dying. And the Hanses basically said that their life was completely over and they they didn't want to live anymore. Jackie Hans wrote a book called When I Will See You Again. And they also opened up something called the Hans Family Foundation. And it's basically to teach young girls to have good self-esteem about themselves, to feel positive about themselves. They're just trying to help young girls, and I think this is because their daughters were taken away from them, and they they felt very broken, but Jackie Hance's friends, they pushed her and told her, you know, you should try to get pregnant again. Jackie Hance's tubes were tied, but she went to a fertilization specialist in October, and in October 11th, 2011, Jackie and Warren Hans ended up getting pregnant with another daughter, which I think is very beautiful. It can't replace, but it can help mend a broken heart. And I just, my heart really goes out to so many of these people because the Bastardi family, they were interviewed. The Longo family, they were interviewed. These were really beautiful people. Like, these families were like, they just were, like, so authentically true New Yorkers with their accent and their their strong personalities, but their very genuine and caring side. I don't know. I just, New Yorkers have, like, this way about them, and I guess I'm stereotyping, but they, they seem like they're so hard, right? Like, they're like, Ur! you know, they drive aggressively, and they're going someplace all the time, and, but... They're very, they have very big hearts, and when things go down, some very, like, big, serious things go down, you get to, like, find out about how good these people are, like, when the 9-11 towers went down and how they all came together to help each other, and even when COVID hit last year, there were a lot of them that went on YouTube and they talked about what was happening, and it, it just, New Yorkers have always impressed me. I just, uh, I've always heard that they're mean, but I don't think that's it at all. I just think that they're survivors and they have a lot of heart. And when I found, when I heard these families interviewed, that definitely did come out. So I'm going to go into the reason why this case hit me so much. That was like the meat and potatoes of the story. There, There is a lot more to it that we could talk about, but that that is the important stuff, I feel like. I want to talk about Diane Schuler and what happened. 
And when I talk, when I say I want to talk about Diane Schuler and what happened, I want to talk about what I think could have happened. So if you don't want to hear this part, you don't have to. But this is my theory, and this is only because I have grown up with alcoholics. I have dear friends that are alcoholics. My grandfather, who uh, was a World War II veteran, he was an alcoholic. My other grandfather was an alcoholic, and. I can tell you right now, something that they talked about with Diane Schuler is that she was the rock. She was always the one in control. She always did these things. And there's no way she could be an alcoholic because she was never, she never appeared intoxicated. She never appeared drunk. But she also kept a lot of her life private. So I just want to say, I don't know if she was an alcoholic. I really don't. But the thing is, is that if you are an alcoholic, there are, there are so many sides to this because some alcoholics are extremely functional. Like they literally, they can just drink and drink and drink and you will never be able to tell it. Their, their tolerances are different. And a lot of doctors say that that's not true because they don't have a tolerance, but I suppose they are better at hiding the fact that they are drunk and they get used to being drunk and so they function being drunk. And Diane Schuler had a little bit of a, of a past. She, she was in a family. She had, I believe, four or five brothers and a father. And when she was nine years old, her mother left. And as the story went, she, her mother left with a I think it was a neighbor, and she left her husband, Diane Schuler's mother, or Diane Schuler's father, and, you know, Diane Schuler never wanted to talk to her mother again. Her mother had a relationship with her brothers, but not with Diane Schuler, so there was a little bit of trauma in her past, and I'm not saying that that caused her to be an alcoholic, but I, I think that sometimes people have demons. And alcohol is a way for them to medicate and deal with it. And, you know, her husband talks about how she had an abscess. They pulled the records. They saw that she did, in fact, have a root canal in, like, 2005, which is pretty common. But also, they said that she did not want to finish root canal. So, I know most of us know what tooth pain is like. And... Back in the day in the Civil War, they used alcohol as a painkiller. So it is possible that she self-medicated because if she was as controlling or as a rock and always got through and was very task-oriented, for her not to be able to arrive home because she had a toothache, maybe that caused her to smoke some marijuana and drink some alcohol. And we don't know. But, but I do know. That the fact that the investigator, a 30-year-old veteran, a 30-year veteran narcotic police officer, and her husband, and her sister-in-law, and attorneys are saying that they can't prove that she was an alcoholic because she didn't act like an alcoholic, that's absolutely absurd. <laughs> it's absurd because alcoholics come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all types of varieties, and one of them is a very functional alcoholic. And and I find that the functional alcoholics break your heart more than any of the other ones. And, and that's just from personal experience, because functional alcoholics, they can just, they'll drink and sometimes their moods will be erratic, but you won't know that they're drinking or or sometimes you, they'll tell you that something's going on and you worry or or there could be a car accident and they just act like they accidentally got into the car accident and there was no alcohol involved and then you find out there was or they do stupid things or they yell at you. It just, Diane Schuller mo most definitely could have been an alcoholic and you know, it's just a really tragic story because she was a 36-year-old mother of two. And no, we don't know what will ever ha whatever happened. But what we do know 
is that science doesn't lie. And the chance of her having some kind of a medical condition that caused there to be alcohol in it, alcohol in her system, and that that never came out prior till that day, it's pretty, pretty low. And the fact that she had THC in her system and it was, it was a high content, according to the coroner and the toxicologist and the toxicology report, that just kind of speaks to the fact that, like, she, she was no stranger to these things. And the vodka being in her front seat in the passenger side or the driver's side where she was, that just is such a red flag because many alcoholics, when they get to the point where they just have to drink, they start hiding vodka. I don't know what it is about vodka. Maybe it's because they think it's a neutral spirit, but they start hiding it. They'll put it in the laundry room. They'll put it in the kitchen, in the garbage. They'll hide it in their car. They'll hide it everywhere. There'll be bottles of vodka everywhere. I know that a lot of people see this in the movie and they think, movies, and they think, oh, this is just like an exaggeration. Listen to me. I have firsthand seen this and it's terrible. It's terrible on the families. It's terrible on them. It's just terrible. And I really do believe that Diane Schuler was drunk. I mean, I don't have to say that I believe that. She was drunk, but I I believe that she was probably a functional alcoholic and the only reason they got she ever got caught is because she got into that accident. And I just I just wanted to talk about it because my heart really just got attached to this story. And and there's psychologists going on YouTube talking about how she tried to kill herself and all these things. Yes, I think she did try to kill herself, but not in the way that the psychologist was speaking about. When you drink like that, you are slowly killing yourself. And who's to say not everything you do is slowly killing yourself, but I believe that just speeds the process up. So that is the Diane Schuler story. That's my take on it. That's the information. I'm pretty exhausted today, so if I was a little shaky or didn't sound perfect like I always want myself to sound like, I really appre- I, I apologize. If you enjoyed my story, please like it. Like the video. It's so important that you do leave me a comment. Tell me what you think. Tell me if you think she was an alcoholic. Do you think that she was suicidal? Do you think she could have had that? It's like a medical condition, the brewery system. You know what I'm talking about. And if you don't Google it, but it's like a condition where you can actually cause your body to have alcohol toxicity and it grows inside of your stomach, something about the yeast or something like that. Do you think that she could have had that and that could have happened? I don't think so, but you never know. I don't know everything. I know a lot, but not everything. So guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing week. I will get this up for you tomorrow. I know you're really waiting for it because I'm so important in your life. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So as always, stay spooky, stay safe, and stay sober.